Hey everyone, it's your favorite host, Marcus Norman of Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today, I've been looking forward to this interview for weeks, this conversation. This man is absolutely phenomenal, incredible, and he is changing the world, starting in Texas, but expanding and growing in so many different words. And now he speaks and coaches and mentors to the problems that we're dealing with in the mental health space and this man i want to say is the focal point of what we need in our communities in our lives and he is clearing a path and showing the way and leading and he speaks to this and he coaches to this and he's been mentoring to this and touching lives and changing impact on families and more importantly our teens and children by helping them cope with the difficulties that we've been facing that we've been seeing in the world today and so i could not hold this man back anyway any way possible. This man is too huge to keep backstage. So help me welcome to the stage the incredible Mr. Austin Davis. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, sir. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Davis. How are you? I'm fantastic, man. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for having me. Excited. It is a tr- It's a true pleasure, sir. You are necessary and you are changing the world in a huge way, in an impactful way. And and before we dive into the uniqueness of your story and what you're doing to create the change that you want to see in the world, when did it hit you? When did you notice that you had a gift to offer the world and serve in the mental health space? When did it hit you? When did you get the bug? Oh, when I got the, so I recount this often, you know, as a, as a, just a yeah, I, I was probably 12 years old. I remember sitting on the curb and the neighbor um, is like just pouring her heart out to me. I'm 12 year old. She's probably 40 at the time or something. And just, I, I recount that knowing, having all the skills. I was like, huh, that thing has been with me for a long, long time of, of people engaging and, um, you know, just, just pouring their heart out to me. And so, those revelations have um, since developed as as life has gone on. So, dealing with people, and thank you for that. I told y'all a heart of pure gold. <laughs> dealing with people is not an easy thing, especially when you when you start traveling, you start meeting other cultures, other ethnicities. Dealing with people is not easy. How do you cope? And how do you how did you learn that you know that there is a real need here, right? Uh, co- coping is, is, a an evolving thing. Um, I play the guitar, I work out. I mean, I, I tell people every day, my, the reason I am, uh, able to do my job is because I wake up at five 30, I read, I pray, I journal, and then I go to my garage and do pushups and sit-ups. Um, if I don't do those things, uh, that first 90 minutes of the day, I, I don't, I'm not successful. Um, that, that day to me is, a uh, a bad day just because it didn't start with uh, Bible and prayer and things like that. And so it, ultimately um, nothing else matters. I mean, I, I play basketball, I play guitar, uh, I like to build stuff, but if it doesn't start with that in the morning, kind of nothing else uh, falls into line. That's so huge. So true. So true. You specifically created a space, an environment f- called the Clear Fork Academy that caters and nurtures teens in dealing with all the problems, drug abuse, drug addictions, family issues, school problems. You created a space and environment which is which is breathtaking and phenomenal and unique in the mental health space. What is it that you're seeing that you saw led you to build this community? That's what I want to call it. That's what comes to mind when I think of yeah. you and your incredible work. What, yeah. what, what did you see that, that started you say, this is a need. I need to build this. Like, no, I look at you like Noah's Ark. I need to build the Ark. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it really began um, at age of 15. Uh, I came to Christ and just felt this call to do ministry. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, had some guys in my local church who went to, um, it's called Lee University. It's in East Tennessee. Uh, so I did my undergrad in pastoral ministries and kind of through that journey felt inadequate. So I, I finished the four year degree and because I was working in a local church, doing all the things um, that inadequacy kind of continued. And and I'm also a nerd. So 
uh, I went to seminary and started the master's in divinity program, got 80 hours into that. And as I'm doing my, my service and, and work in the local church, um, when a kid catches the house on fire, gets pregnant, runs away from home, gets in a fight, you know, just fill in the blank of what adolescents are facing. Um, we weren't opening Romans and, and exegeting and, and looking at Greek and all those things. And I was just asking questions. You know, it was that 12 year old sitting on the curb with the neighbor lady um, that that was coming out. And so I went to my dean and said, hey, um, I think I want to take this professional counseling route. And um, that, that just grew. He kind of looked at me, you know, eyes crossed because I had like six hours left to finish the degree. Uh, ended up getting a master's in counseling and then started working in psych hospitals and case management and all, ended up working in the inpatient adult uh, treatment world. And there again was sort of that epiphany uh, because I'm sitting in a room with 30, 40 and 50 year olds. And inevitably, you know, John starts talking about his story. And I'm like, John, when did that happen? He's like, oh, when I was 14. And then instantly Bill gets engaged and he goes, wow, that happened to me. Uh, when I was 15. And then Sam says the same, you know, so the whole room now is uh, reminiscing and and digging through childhood stuff um, that had put them in that seat uh, today. And so um, the light bulbs went off and, you know, I was like, okay, what if uh, these men could have a clear fork uh, at 14? And maybe now they, they didn't heal all the way, but they were on a different path that didn't lead them to treatment at 30 or 40 or 50. And so um, the goal was, can I combine my uh, youth pastor calling and my clinical education and smash those things together so that we can get change early on in kids' lives um, to where there's not that that carnage behind them uh, for 20, 30 years. Facts. That's such facts. I, I recently, thank you for breaking that down so delicately. Yeah. I recently, and this was news to me, um, I recently was talking to a mental health professional, has their own practice, their own business, been in business for like 10, 15 years. And there's a lot of pushbacks from the parents to kind of say that, oh, what my child is dealing with is not real. You know, yeah. it's a one it's a one off thing. So that child that burned down the school. Oh, that's just him acting out. What? Yeah. You know, so can you speak to how do you handle cases where parents are in denial about their children's mental health issues? <laughs> uh, that's funny because I, I do admissions calls um, a lot of times or early on. I did all of our admissions calls and literally had a kid uh, with a firearm, scales and drugs in the back of his car. And his mom goes, I, I just don't know. I don't think he's he's really you know that bad right now. I'm like, mom, like he's running with gangs. He's selling drugs in your neighborhood. Um, you know, so <laughs> we, mm. we, need to, we need to address that. Uh, Sure. Uh, so it's it's psychoeducation. It's building trust with the family to to really kind of hold up a mirror to them um, and, and just walk them through the signs and symptoms of, of really what is not teenage angst. Right. Like teenagers are going to have all kinds of stuff going on, but like substance use and uh, severe mental health issues. Th those are abnormal uh, situations that need intervention. For sure. For sure. I, I I need your help debunking this myth, right? This is a huge myth that people think that the mental that this is this is gonna go away, right? Mm -hmm. And so, can you help debunk a myth um, with that? Is this real? Is it how how booked how booked up are you and your team as far as work and dealing with teenagers and helping teenagers get through, you know? Not even life, but just their early years. Is is this this true? Is it is it really serious? So I'm torn. Um, you know, I'm I'm a mental health provider, and I make my living off of uh, people's crisis, right? And um, we're not taking advantage of. But I, this is where I'm torn is because I think if if parents would toe the line with their kids. And they would take their devices away and they would use these two letters that are super, super powerful. They would put them together. It's an N and it's an O and they would say no. Um, kids kids would um, are, are naturally resilient. Um, so part of me says, you know, this isn't that big of a deal because 
because we can, we, we've been gifted by God to raise our kids. Um, and I don't think people see that as a spiritual mantle or a right or a duty. And it's the education system. It's the church. It's, it's everybody else's thing. Uh, so all of that set all of that on the back burner right now. And I will tell you, we're in an epidemic. We're in a crisis. We're in a, um, a, a time where kids have no uh, skills or ability to take care of themselves. And they need people like me and other professionals to help them guide them through life. So true. So true. That's that. Thank you for that. That's so true to, to continue. I saw this short clip on 60 minutes about mm -hmm. the state of our current mental health crisis. You guys watch, watch this, tune this in. Tune in. The U S surgeon general has called it an urgent public health crisis a devastating decline in the mental health of kids across the country. According to the CDC, the rates of suicide, self-harm, anxiety, and depression are up among adolescents. Is there any group that's not being impacted? No, we're seeing it all. Kids, you know, who come from very well-off families, kids who don't, kids who are suburban, kids who are urban, kids who are rural, we're, we're seeing it all. This is 48 days, and for children, it's often longer. What does it say to you that the place they have to come is the emergency room? That there's something wrong with our system? The emergency room should not be the place to I have a couple questions for you to answer on the iPad. To manage the mental health crisis and heavy caseload, Dr. Pickett introduced an iPad with a series of questions that screen the mental health of every child 10 and older who comes to your family would be better off if you were dead. Harsh questions that can be lifesavers to the kids your generation, like, got hit with this in what's supposed to be kind of a fun, carefree time. What was lost? What well, did you guys lose during the pandemic? Myself. Yourself. Kids are able to see their friends again and play sports, that this would all go away. Has it? No. No, I've noticed that the wait lists are longer. Kids are struggling with more anxiety, more depression. It was it was over 50 of them that just flooded my mind. I don't really know if it was from all the, like, just antisocialness. And so having the therapist in our clinic to really just have I've got a team together, discuss that patient and family together, to bounce ideas off of each other, because we both know them so well. Find mental health resources for kids and families in crisis at 60minutesovertime.com. Huge. Huge, 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 Mr. Davis. This is this is he debunked the myth, y'all. He just debunked this myth that it's huge. It's bigger than we we think, and we really need as families, as parents. And he said it earlier, right? If you missed that, he said the biggest powerful tool that we can give our communities, our families, is that N O word. I remember growing up with you know hearing that, and you know my dad told me no all the time. My parents told me no all the time. And it, it reignited something in me and it, it made me more creative because yeah. my parent, I want those shoes. I want that that car. I want that that jewelry. I want to go to the prom. I want to go out with my friends. How powerful is that? No. What, what do you see that? How, how can that create impact with just those two simple words? Well, I mean, we have we have a whole generation of kids. I don't think we've ever heard it. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're in this depression time, but we're still the most affluent and we have everything at the push of a button. Um, it doesn't matter what socioeconomic status you are. We still have, uh, you know, the Burger King mentality to your, your way right away. Um, and, and so when we, we it's really a, an empowerment tool to tell kids, no, I've watched my kids. Uh, I have three. I have my son is 12 and then I have two girls. Eight. Congrats. Yeah, they're they're amazing. But it's the hardest thing for me to do, but it's also the most rewarding because when I say, you know, my son, we, we bought him a Nintendo or something, you know, a couple couple years ago. And we have very strict boundaries on when when they can play that. Um, it's only on Saturdays. It's for two hours. Um, but when those two hours up, you know, hey, dad, can we play more? Hey, dad, can we do, you know, hey, dad, it's Tuesday. Can we play? No, you know, we have boundaries to that. And then what they do after that is phenomenal. They go outside, they jump on the trampoline. I hear them laughing. I hear them giggling. They build stuff. They, you know, they ruin the yard, but they, they're making memories that they would not have made. They're, they're 
um, having physical touch and play time and like all the, all the good dopaminergic stuff um, that builds memories and builds relationships and, and just builds them into uh, like adults, like, like healthy humans. And then Nintendo's not going to do that for them. Facts. So that word no is super, super powerful to me. Facts. Hashtag mic drop. If I could give him a mic, y'all, another mic, not the one he's using. That is so significant. That is needed. It's it's powerful, y'all. Tell your kids no. You're not harming them. No. You're you're actually oh. the opposite. You're empowering them to take their life into their own hands instead of asking you to give them something to satiate their temporary moment. Thanks. I want to I want to backtrack here on your and pick your brain. You touched on education is contributing to our kids' mental health. You also included social media. How is specifically social media affecting us? Because time after time we run into the, that that mom, that dad that's like, okay, my kid's crying. Let me give him the laptop. Let mm -hmm. me give him the tablet. Let me give him a cell phone. Let me give him that gaming system. How how is social media and technology impacting our youth today? You know, for one, I'm I'm so glad I didn't grow up with a phone, right? And grow, grow up with, well, I remember when the pager came out and we were <laughs> awesome because we could send, you know, coded messages. Uh, it, I, I really think it it is um, probably the number one contributor to our kids' depression and anxiety, right? The the FOMO, the fear of missing out, the um, the, the things that get posted and they get bullied and man, it, it's just, it, it is a hundred thousand times faster than we could ever communicate as kids. And so, and it's out there forever and like, there's no erasing it. So I, I don't, I don't know the answer. Um, we know uh, all the statistics and how damaging it is and what it does to our psyche and our nervous system and, and the hangovers and the, the you know, the addiction component of it um uh, it it's it's uh it's huge right so I, I think it's it's really perpetuating and fueling um all the stuff all the stuff it's it's huge bigger you hear to hear first y'all bigger than we could ever imagine and the list the list is extensive this is not a short list this is not a that this is huge what's affecting our children is really big and it's really devastating I, i'm on the website for clear folk academy and when i tell you this website is very well done but more importantly it's very detailed and it links to the most important things that we need to be paying attention of so for our audio listeners we have the website clearforkacademy.com mm -hmm. and it touches on things that they help with um because these are what our children are actually facing opioid treatment depression treatment anxiety treatment trauma treatment suicidal ideation what, what out of all of these or some of these, what is the most common one that you're seeing? Well, I think depression and anxiety are, are, are two sides of the same coin and every kid comes in with those, right? Depression um, is, is kind of fear of, of what I did and anxiety is kind of fear of what's in front of me. Um, and so both of those things, um, every kid comes in and they're, they're, they're coping either with drugs or with self-harm. Um, those, those are the two ends of that mental health um, spectrum. But yeah, depression, and anxiety, um, nobody knows how to self-regulate anymore. Again, I think going back to the devices and going back to just this dopamine saturation that we're always in. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's it, you know? Absolutely. I want to shift gears here because you do something this isn't just like some outreach um, program. This is actually people can actually send their children to Clear Fork Academy and actually live on campus. Help me break yeah. that down because that's unique. That's that's yeah. unique. It's actually it, like I, I don't want to say a vacation, right? Because that's not what it is. But <laughs> I, I know as that. a kid, I know as a kid, if I would almost. This place is beautiful, y'all. Again, for my audio listeners, this place is beautiful. I would almost fake some problems just so I could go. But tell us the great work that you do and and the design of the the, the building and uh, and how many students can you hold yeah. or how many teenagers can you hold? All of that. Can you share some so, of those? So right now, um, 
we have 90 teenagers um, in our programs and we have four locations. Um, we have a boys campus that was kind of our flagship. That's what we started with. Um, we have 44 kids there now, I think. Um, and so it's 37 acres. It's uh, sitting on in front of the lake. Um, so it's a, it's a beautiful, serene um, environment. And so that's kind of our idea is we want to be as clinical as hospitals but also relational and have the feel of home and or a youth camp. And so that's kind of our idea and mentality was most treatments are uh, kind of on that spectrum of I'm in a, you know, four concrete walls of a hospital or I'm in sort of a boarding school um, environment, kind of like a youth camp. So we kind of smashed the two together. Um, we've got a girls campus, probably an hour south in Cleburne, Texas, um, just a, a kind of a petite version of what we have on our Fort Worth campus. And so between those two, we can have 80 uh, teenagers at a time. And then we have two outpatient locations. And so our inpatient locations, they stay with this for, for 90 days. Um, we have a, a curriculum that follows our core values and clinical interventions. And then our life skills kind of are the, the foundation of everything that and it builds up from there. Uh, and then our, there are outpatients, um, you know, they can walk in and do uh, five days, three days or, or single days uh, worth of, of treatment with our clinical team. Super, super. Powerful. I told you, I told you in Paxful, this man is changing the world. Sir, I wanted to ask on. So are the, are the students um, first off, what's the process to enroll my son or daughter in the camp? Once they're in, what's happening um, with them in far as indoctrination into it? Yeah. Um, so the easiest way to get um, into the program is through our website, clearforkacademy.com. Top right hand corner is a uh, phone number that rings to our, our admissions and assessment team. And so they'll do a, you know, a, a phone screening, uh, make, make sure that, you know, you're appropriate, we're appropriate and ask all the right questions for safety and um compliance kind of things. But then from there, I mean, we could we could do a same day admission if everything checks off and we get all the paperwork filled out. Um, then from there, we're we're really um, we, we build on our core values every single day. And so we have seven values, um, honor, unity, sacrifice, transparency, legacy, excellence and fun. Um, and those are the themes that drive every week. Um, we we are Christ centered. Um, but we use our values as sort of um, a neuter way to introduce faith because I, I assume every single kid is mad at me, <laughs> mad at their parents, and mad at whoever God is in their life. And so, um, you know, a lot of our kids come to us agnostic or um, anywhere in the spectrum, right? And so we use our values really to engage them in a human way and show them what honor looks like. Hey, look, I'm going to honor you through this process. Um, I'm going to build uh, trust with you through transparency. And, you know, when we say fun, we're just talking about enjoying the process. Um, so I know I took your phone. I know I took your drugs. I know I took your girlfriend. I know, I, you know, I took your freedom. Right. And I, I'm, you're mad at me for that, but here's what I want you to try is enjoy that process. And we know um, that every situation can change by just a simple thought. Um, and so we just challenge our kids to do that and say, Hey, look, you're going to be here for 90 days. Let's get the most out of it. Facts. Do I have to have insurance? You do not have to. Uh, it can be pricey without it. Uh, we have, you know, doctors, nurses, master's level clinicians, um, and 127 employees that, uh, like to feed their families. So <laughs> that's fair. That's honest. That's fair. Right. It's yeah. A, yeah. The cost, the cost of treatment, uh, um, you know, is about a thousand dollars a day, uh, without insurance. That's fair. And that's fair. And, and again, these are top of the line professionals. And so they have to feed their families y'all. But again, is there's an option, right? There's, there's financing options you can apply for. You can look into, um, it depends to me, we make thing things are only expensive when you don't see the value in them. 100%. So, so if you, if I see my child with problems, what would you do? Right? What, what, what mountain would you not climb in order to get them better? 
And well, like, and, and we, we treat it like, you know, so I, I got three kids, right? If my son's climbing a tree and he's 20 feet in the air and he slips and falls and his arm snaps in half and, you know, I, my, my new truck is sitting out in the driveway, right? Um, I'm going to go grab him blood and all, put him in my leather seats, let him destroy the back seat, And we're going to the hospital as fast as we can. I don't care if I get a ticket because my kid's arm is snapped in half. If we thought about mental health that way, um, we wouldn't see this crisis the way we would, but, but we allow it. We're like, Oh, he just slipped and fell. Right. Oh, that, that'll heal up. Oh, you know, it's not really, you know, but if we looked at it and we saw, and we were educated, um, you know, on, on what the signs and symptoms look like, we, we would react differently. Absolutely true. 1000% true. Absolutely. If I, again, another might drop huge, huge points. We have to make it important. Y'all we have mm -hmm. to make it important. Just like the air we breathe. It's important. You can't see it, but it's there and it's real. It's necessary. What are your thoughts and what are your team's thoughts on the use of medications in treating teenage mental health problems? Yeah. So uh, I, I think medications are very important um, for a time. Um, I, you know, I go back and forth as I, I personally, um, very naturopathic and organic and, and things like that. Um, I do think there's an element for, we use medications, we have doctors and nurses and all the things, uh, but for a period of time. And my hope is, is that we can stabilize a kid um, and then we can teach them skills to internally and organically stabilize themselves. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of long-term medication use, um, you know, we can go into conspiracy theories on how big pharma has, has created this problem for us. Um, you're right. And, and kind of talked about that for, for a while, but, uh, I do think that's a, a part of the problem is, is, you know, they make dollars as we get more sick. And, uh, do we really solve anything when we take medications? Sometimes maybe not, you know? Yeah. I, I recently, and you're, you're 100%, not to dive into conspiracy theories, but I recently saw um, a professional talking about sometimes we're medicating our children too early, right? Oh, yeah. That school, you know, that, that principal, that nurse at the school is saying, oh, your child is, has ADHD. We, we need to medicate. And it's like, sometimes it can be too early. Oh, right? I, our brains aren't developed until we're 25 as men. And, and so if I think if I grew up today, somebody would have put me on medication, yeah. um, right? He's too but, hyper. He's too. Yeah. 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 He, 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 you know, wants to stand up and walk around in class. He won't be shut his mouth. He, you know, but that's what makes me successful today. I mean, a lot of our kids have that entrepreneurial energy um, and it's just been misguided or misstewarded. And it, it kind of goes back to that family unit for me. And there's no way in the world teachers should be suggesting medication for kids. They just want kids to drool on themselves so they don't because they're, they're not empowered. Right. They're not empowered to tell that kid, no, sit down, be quiet or they get in trouble. So <laughs> it's that it's that that problem again for us. Yeah, it's super it's super full. It's it's they don't have the resources. Right. They don't have access to the tools. Um professionals like you and your team, they don't have access to resources. And then I think the second part is they're experiencing burnout, right? You oh. got a teacher with a classroom full of 50 kids and yep. you know, you got kids running over here to jumping out one sw swinging from the chandeliers and it's like, they're burned out. And they're like, if I could just get this classroom quiet. Yeah. And they're my wife taught for 10 years. She did. She has a master's in education. Um, so you're preaching to the choir and you know, we, it was an uphill battle for her every day. And so, you know, we're blessed that she gets to stay home and raise our three kids and do homeschool. Uh, so we don't have to deal with that. So she doesn't have to be afraid really, you know, because that, that's a, that, that, that could be a, a, um, caustic environment for, for a teacher to go into that every single day, you know? That's so true. So true. I told you bring in the sauce. Mr. Davis here on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. Speaking of preaching to the choir, we got to pay some. <laughs> we got to pay some bills. Okay, we, go for we, it. We will be right back. Don't go anyway. Stay tuned. Stay with us. We'll be right right back. 
Baby Gear Services DMV specializes in high quality baby gear rentals in the Maryland and DC metro area. We have a wide range of baby gear items for rent, including wooden cribs, car seats, high chairs, and more. We also offer seasonal specials and free delivery. Our prices are very versatile to cover every budget. Wooden cribs start at $17 a day, high chairs and even car seats start at $5 a day. Check out our website, www.bgsdmv.com. Support for Gentleman Style Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers you precision engineering tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. You heard that right, the 4.0. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off free worldwide shipping with the code GENSTYLE at manscaped.com. Are you a local business looking to offer your customers easy access to cash without having to travel miles? We're here to help. At Norman Legacy Investments, we provide free ATMs with free installation that provide a suitable investment for your business. Even better, we offer you some profit sharing and handle everything from start to finish. Just reach out to us today to schedule a free consultation. We are back to the Gentleman Style Podcast Show. And today I have the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Austin Davis here on the Gentleman Style Podcast Show, spilling the tea on how he's changing the world, one teenager, young one boy, one girl at a time, and helping them get the tools. He talked about that earlier. He the Clear Folk Academy gives them the tools to help them cope with the stressors of everyday life. He talked about the different points and things that are contributing to the problems we are seeing in the mental health space with our teenagers, with our young girls, our young boys, where it be education, social media, and prescription medication. If you missed any of that, go back, scroll back, check him out. He's absolutely phenomenal. We are on Apple, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Ghana Radio, radio radio.com, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere. You get your podcast today. He is absolutely phenomenal. Sir, I want to address something because, you know, you can't talk about mental health and you can't talk about your incredible academy without talking about there's a potential for relapsing, right? Mm -hmm. You can do all the great things. We can be as as proactive as we want, but there's a potential for relapse. And so I want to ask you, how does Clear Folk Academy address the potential for relapse in teens? After they leave your program, what 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 steps do you and your team take to yeah, so to deal with that? The, the catchphrase for us is, you know, discharge planning starts on day one. Um, so you, you get in, a, in an airplane and it goes up and it has a destination. Um, and at some point they say, stow your, you know, all your things and landing gear comes down. And that is a slow and gradual transition uh, to the ground. And so when we think about our treatment, um, stays, we want it to look a lot like that, uh, trajectory. And so that's huge for us is having a a good home plan, a good transition. And really that's why we created our two outpatient programs is because what we saw was, uh, we we have a kid for 90 days. Uh, we do family, we do groups, we do individual, we do all the good work, but then we send them right back home, um, with very little resources. And so we created the two outpatients for that. Um, and, and, in theory, we could have a kid in services for six months with us um, with, with no problems. And that length of stay really abates the, the relapse potential. Um, and so we go a step further with that. We have a whole an alum, alumni team uh, that is working with our kids. And so uh, they, they build rapport while they're in treatment with the families. Uh, we do a Tuesday night Zoom call with all of them. Uh, we do quarterly events. Uh, so we're always engaged with our kids, text message and on social, just trying to stay connected with them. Uh, because when they are 
tempt it or have potential relapse, we want to be right there uh, to help support them and walk them through. And, and so that it's, it could be just a bump in a road instead of full off into the ditch um, and, you know, death or, or, you know, that's the biggest consequence, right? So sure. um, we stay engaged with the families and, and we have our alumni team constantly just staying in connection. This is after discharge. The team connects with them via text, say, how you doing? Wanted to reach out. Um, recently saw that y'all did an event at Six Flags. So that's powerful. That's we including, did. that's people inside treatment and outside. That's included. Yeah, that's, uh, you, you You know, once you're part of the Clear Fork family, you know, it's it's like Hotel California. You can't leave. <laughs> um, you know, so we, we just stay engaged, stay uh, connected. And it's, it's, it's relationships, right? When the, the reason why we have mental health and substance abuse is because people aren't in healthy communities. Um, if, if we had healthy communities, we had mentors, then we go, hey, dude, I'm struggling. And then somebody who like loved us would say, what are you struggling with? Right. And we have that going back and forth of, of community and relationship. And that, to me, ultimately kind of solves our problem. So true. So true. Absolutely necessary. I w- and thank you for breaking that down. Right? Most times it's like, OK, I'm going to take your money. I'm going to take your insurance. We're going to get that copay and you're out the door. Right. They just yeah. it, and hope for the best. Right. Fingers crossed. Oh, and if yeah. you need me again call me back and we'll get you on the schedule. And that's, that's, that's right. not enough, right? You you've done this great work and you almost, you negate the work because you just kind of leave them to yeah. their own devices. And and if the environment doesn't change, right? Because what got you into that bad habit? What got you into the drugs? It's the, the community, right? Friends, mm-hmm. maybe family, maybe, yeah. you know, where you live. And so continuing that service is huge. And it's major. And that's that's big. Big, big, big. So powerful. Sir, your team is incredible. And you, know, <laughs> you have a heart uh, as big as Mount Rushmore. But I got to ask it the hard question. How do you and your team balance the need for discipline with the need for compassion in the treatment setting? Because that's a yeah. very hard line. To, it's like knowing when to put that that no and put the hammer in there not physical but just the hammer yeah. and be a little rough and then but also be compassionate and have that heart for what they're dealing with how do you balance that that's that spectrum kind of talked about you know we will be as relational as a youth camp and clinical as a hospital and so once once we build relationships with our kids uh we can say a lot of things that are pointed straight to their heart um you know, I can look at a kid once he's told me his story about his abandonment and, you know, about his uh, broken heart or about his trauma, all of those things. I can look them square in the eye and say, look, John, you're acting out of your fear. You're acting out of your woundedness and everything you're doing right now is not helping you get better. So stop it. And that, you know, they, they're like, oh, my God, nobody's ever talked to me that way. Um and, and it's because we've built relationship, because uh, we have um, this connectivity with our kids each and every day. That being said, sometimes we don't have that. And we have a good old like uh, checks and balances or a level system. Uh, we know we're all driven uh, by the scoreboard. And so uh, we, we have uh, points and rewards that our kids can grow. Um, and, and when they grow and they, you know, check the box, uh, they get rewards, right? It could be going on the boat. It could be extra uh, basketball time. It could be uh, extended visitation or something like that. So it, it's both um, a checks and a balance, kind of the carrot and stick um, and relationship, because everything we want to do, we want it to build on a therapeutic alliance and process uh, because we want to speak to the deeper issues of the heart not just sit them sit them down and make them be compliant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking about extending your stay, um, what's the minimum time um, someone, you have out treatment, so there's that piece to Clear Fork Academy, but the in treatment piece where they can stay on site, what's the minimum time that a teenager, boy or girl can stay on site? And have you had any requests for like extension? Hey, you know, any, can we extend? Can we, this is working. Um, and we're almost there. We're almost across the finish line. Can they stay a bit longer? Any opportunities there? Any things that are there? 
Yeah, absolutely. So what we'll do is a short of stay is, you know, four to seven days for a medical detox. Mom, dad come in, um, you know, and, and they drop the kid off to say, hey, we, we want him to be free of opiates. Uh, we want his head clear. And then we're going to go to do outpatient or something like that. So we'll, we'll do, you know, an inpatient detox. Is it is it what we want, desire? Is it kind of our our game plan or our roadmap? Absolutely not. We know at least 60 days of treatment is is kind of to break the cycle, to engage them mentally, physically, and spiritually. And our hope is to get them to 90 days because the first 30 days is just barely building trust and rapport. The middle 30 days is, is about understanding what needs to be on their treatment plan and addressing those things, like those deeper issues of the heart. And then once we've built trust and we've addressed the, the treatment plan, now we can put things into action. Um, you know, I just, th just think about somebody's like really bad golf swing, right? Like you're correcting those maladaptive patterns of behavior in those last 30 days of treatment um, that, that really give you long-term care. Super dope. Super dope. I wanted to ask the question, are there any methods that sets Clear Fork Academy apart from any other facility that's helping kids in the mental health space? Are there any um, things that you guys do that sets you apart from everyone else? Yeah, there's there's probably three things. Um, we're gender specific. Um, and so we have two campuses that aren't attached to each other. We think that's very important um, that boys can be boys and, and girls can be girls separately and autonomously. Um, then we have a family program that's standalone. A lot, a lot of people will combine or not even do family work. Um, but we believe that as the family gets healthier, the kid is, the kid's health is a byproduct of that. Um, so we have a whole, uh, team of LMFTs, um, and, and master's level clinicians that work specifically with the family to grow them in skills and grow them in insight. And we'll do uh, three family intensives while they're in our program. And those are two to three days at a time of just immersive psychoeducation and process groups. Um, so they get better. And, and we see that a lot of times we teach them the, that word no, right in the middle of those groups. And so when, when, you know, Johnny comes in for visitation and throws a fit. Mom just looks at him and goes, hey, I just learned this. Um, I'm going to use this word with you that I've never really used and it's probably going to hurt. Um, no, you can't talk to me that way. And if you continue, I'm going to get in the car and go home. Um, you know, and the kid's just like, uh, OK. And, and mom did it well. Mom didn't do it sarcastically or passive aggressively. She was calm. She was had good eye contact and and did those things correctly. And that'll change a family's life. Um, and then I think the third thing um, it is our Christ centeredness. Um, you know, we use the 12 steps and got our own understanding as part of that. But when we interpret that, man, I, I spent eight years in, in, in doing Bible and theology. So it's like I can't pull that thing out of the, tr the therapeutic process for us. Um, and all of that is is wrapped up. I guess there's a fourth one in there, right? Those are our three uniques. And then our fourth one is our curriculum. I wrote our curriculum after being a therapist for 15 years or so and just seeing um, what works and what doesn't work. And so we put that into a scope and sequence for the 90 days. And so every kid kind of gets the recipe as they go through treatment because we know the recipe works. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is, what do you consider a successful treatment? How do you measure success of your treatment programs at Clear Folk Academy? Uh, by rule, we measure 90% uh, of completion, goal completion on their treatment plan, right? So if they have 10 goals, we meet nine of them. Um, that, that, that is what we measure on a day-to-day -day basis. But the, the sort of subjective thing is really just a heart change. Um, and I, and I call it one degree, right? If we can get one degree, I think that's successful because if we think about, you know, uh, there's one degree of change over time, right? If we're, if we're flying from here to London, right. And we're one degree off, whatever the math is, we're like in South Africa, right? It's, it's over time, there's a distance. And if, if we can be that for a kid's life 
and and to measure their success in just one degree, I think we've done our job. We have been the clear fork. We've stood at the crossroads of their lives. We've shown them the ancient pathways. We've told them which way to go. And there's some rest. There, there's some aha moments. Um, that's that's the sort of subjective way we measure success. I, I just caught on to this. Um, how did you come? Thank you for that. <laughs> um, I just caught on to this. How did you come up with the name Clear Fork? <laughs> well, uh, it, it's it's three ways. Um, number one, we live, you know, in the Fort Worth area. There's Eagle Mountain Lake, and we have the Trinity River, the the West Fork, and then the Clear Fork River, um, or offshoot of that. Um, and and I'm a CBT therapist, um, so you know, there's there's these negative thoughts, and so I want to transition those negative thoughts and schemas and beliefs into positive things. So there's a, there's a transition, you know, I say it's we're our brains are on the highway to hell. When you enter our facility, there's just no stopping you. Right. And so there's gotta be an exit ramp or a clear fork in the road. Um, and then, uh, Jeremiah six sixteen um, just, just says, stand at the crossroads and look, ask where the ancient pathway is, ask where the good way is walk in it and you'll find rest for your soul. That was God's command to his people, um, when they were wayward. And so if it was good for them, I think it'd be good for us in sort of a treatment mentality um, to, to help our kids understand where they're going. <laughs> Shame on me for catching that way too late. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. Sir, that that is phenomenal. And, and again, the work that you're doing, again, I've been truly excited because our kids are our future. Right. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, the adults, is, is, we're kind of set, right? Adults are kind of set. But if I think you're what you're doing with our kids is making a better future and a better tomorrow, because, you know, that's how you change the world. That's how you create the change that you want to see, because, you know, it's not the adults. And, and so and, but even though you do incorporate the family structure and the family dynamic, um, and I think you said it earlier, parents can come visit their kids. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do visitation every weekend. They have phone calls and, you know, FaceTime and things like that throughout the week and then in-person visitation. So it's not, you're not sending your child off to boot camp, even though some of these kids need that, that staff sergeant in their face, um, yelling at them and just showing, Hey, your mom is working three jobs. She's killing herself, right. Trying to provide for you. So huge, huge, huge. Mr. Davis, how do you see the future of mental health treatment for teenagers evolving? Um, whether it be technology space, um, and what do you see um, other practices doing? Uh, I know you attend conferences as a professional, you and your team attend. So, what do you see coming down the pipeline? Well, I, I think um, for the longest time, adult mental health treatment has been the primary thing. So, when we started Clear Fork, everybody, because I came from the adult world, everybody's like, "Dude, don't do it!" Like kids are nuts; they'll they'll drive you crazy and this and that. I was like, yeah, all that's true, but it's got to be done. Um, so I, I think we're sort of a pioneer in the space. And so people uh, from the outside are going, OK, maybe if Austin can do it, then then maybe we can do it. And so I, I think um, and a lot of this is, is you know going to be private equity driven and, and big business. Um, people are going to get into the space and uh, you've already seen it on the outpatient side. Uh, where all of these outpatient centers are, are just chocked full with patients. Um, and a lot of them are adolescent focused. And so I, I think there will be sort of this surge of, um, uh, you know, of, of capitalists, you know, trying to come into the market. Um, and I think they're, they're have, have good intentions um, to, to serve the population because they're just, there's a wait list. There's just a wait list of kids um I think the schools are going to catch on too. Um, we've seen that sort of in our area to where schools are building in better curriculum and having more resources in schools and um, trying to abate that, that thing. So they don't, they don't lose seat time, you know? For sure. For sure. And, and I know you have the outpatient portion to clear fork, but if someone, and with the invention of, of telehealth, <laughs> COVID <laughs> reminded us that we have this option as yeah, well yeah. to treat our youth, but if someone was truly adamant about getting their child and they're out of state, they're out of the Texas area, 
could yeah. they still um, fly in and, and, and 100%. We have 25% of our kids right now are from outside the state. Um, we've had a kid from Puerto Rico who stayed with us for six months. Um, you know, we, we had some Spanish speaking staff who were, we were like, I think we can make this work, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and we did, we did. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's no, um, don't have to be local at all. So only about 25% of our kids are from the local market. Um, the rest of them are about 200 to, you know, 500 miles away and then outside the state. Do you do any work with immigration for kids and teenagers? Any work there with um, that? No, not really. Um, yeah, we, we we haven't haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Um, but but I think that will. Um, yeah. When you go go back to your other question, I think that'll be a huge huge sure. thing coming up for the migrant population uh, once they settle in and begin to receive services, we're gonna see a huge spike in community-based need. Um, and that's where, you know, states and, and Medicaid, Medicare, we're gonna have to um, really show up. We're gonna have to open up, yeah. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge. <laughs> Mr. Austin Davis, y'all. <laughs> incredible. Sir, this has been an incredible, conversation you are absolutely phenomenal clear fork and what you're doing and your team is changing the absolute world and the space in mental health i appreciate it. are there any questions that i should have asked you that you wanted to share that you that i missed anything that i missed anything there man I, I would just say to to your listeners don't wait like don't don't wait um give us a call give someone a call don't wait till your kid ends up in the er uh, with an overdose or a suicide attempt or something like that. Like, let's do intervention. Let's get it early. Um, our kids deserve it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how can people connect with you? How can people get on board? The train has already left the station, but it's not too late. Your child is not too late. It's not too late for them. How can people connect? Yeah. Clearforkacademy.com. Um, that's, that's the easiest way. All of our stuff is on there. Uh, you can find us on social uh, you can find me on LinkedIn and all the things. So absolutely connect, connect, connect. Don't give up y'all. Don't give up. Our children are not lost. They're, they're, they're not forsaken, right? Don't give up on them. If you give up on them, you're giving up on our future. And Mr. Austin Davis and his team are here to help. They're here to help. When I, when I think of clear fork Academy, I think what comes to mind is hope. Yeah. It's hope. Amen. It's hope. So, like we and we gotta let this man go this man is incredible we are out of time unfortunately we gotta let him go but i hope this message was impactful i hope this was inspirational i hope this helps you realize that there are options and there's hope in us for our kids for our for our future and it's not too late mr davis i want to say this to you publicly don't ever quit we need you we need what you're doing thank you absolutely thank you. And thank you all for tuning into the Gentleman Style Podcast show. Like we end every show. Take care of your friends. Take care of your family. And always, always take care of business. This is Marcus, your favorite gentleman, and the super fragilistic, expialidocious Mr. Austin Davis, Clear Fork Academy, signing off. Love you guys. Peace.